All right, dealing with divorce, difficult issues, biblical answers, lesson number six in this uh, series. We're talking about domestic violence, uh, the secret sin, and this is part two of this uh, particular topic. So last time we, uh, we looked at some of the causes of domestic violence as well as a profile of the abuser and a profile of the victim. Today we're going to examine what the law and what the Bible say about domestic violence. Now there are several laws on the books uh, in the state of Oklahoma and, I, and I'm, I'm you know, pretty certain in, in every state, but certainly in the state of Oklahoma there are laws on the books that deal specifically with battery, uh, domestic violence and spousal abuse. And I'll just quickly read one here, probable cause of arrest, uh, Title 22, Section 40.6, 40.3. It says, a peace officer may arrest without warrant a person anywhere, including his place of residence, if the peace officer has probable cause to believe the person has within the preceding four hours committed an act of domestic abuse, although the assault did not take place in the presence of the peace officer. So that gives the uh, police a kind of a wide uh, latitude to make a decision uh, as far as arresting someone for domestic abuse. Uh, there are uh, dozens of laws on the books that deal with everything from spousal abuse to protective orders and violation of these. Also uh, medical treatment and access to counseling for people who are in the situation. Uh, the courts will usually enforce these if there is a complaint filed, but this is where the problem lies. The victim is usually talked or threatened out of doing so for various reasons. Uh, the only sure thing about batterers is that they will repeat their actions unless there's an intervention. I repeat that. The only sure thing that we know is that if there isn't an intervention, they continue with this behavior. Despite all the apologies and all the promises, it just keeps right on going. Uh, the greatest uh, um, uh, defense for the batterer is secrecy. Let's keep it secret. Uh, many times a first offense is reported, it's recorded, it's dealt with through counseling and probation. So when you get it out into the open and deal with it right away, it lessens the chance of the cycle repeating itself. That's the message that uh, counselors and professionals that work in this area try to get across to uh, victims. Get it out in the open, deal with it. If left alone too long, there are all kinds of complications. I mean, just children, dealing with the children. Uh, and the success rate for counseling goes down because of a deeply ingrained cycle. So the longer it goes, the worse it gets, the harder it is to fix. So the key to breaking the cycle is to report the violence as soon as it starts and get it on the record. So what do counselors recommend? What can a, an, an individual expect from counselors if they go and report this problem? So if a person has been trapped in this cycle of domestic abuse for any length of time, counselors and women's shelters workers say that the key issue is safety. Safety. Research has shown that the abuse is an ongoing thing. If the woman fights back, it's likely to get worse. <laughs> You what? You hit me? You struck me back? Oh, well now I'm you know, going to double down on it. If she leaves without a plan or protection, she's likely to get dragged back into the cycle or hurt in other ways. Counselors recommend that if you are dealing with someone who is in this type of situation, this is what you need to try to do. First of all, remember, not if you're the one, but if you know someone who's going through this, what should you do? Well, listen carefully. No judging, no blaming, no taking sides. You know, it's easy to take sides and say, well, if it's a woman who's the victim, it's easy to say, oh, that guy, what a rotter. I always knew he was that way. I suspected it from the very beginning. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Just listen, take in the information. If the person is reassured that you are listening objectively, she may trust your advice later on. Secondly, try to explain to her 
that her situation is not unique. She's not the only one that's ever gone through this. It fits a pattern of the domestic violence cycle. She needs to know that others go through this and it's, it's not normal. This is not normal. To be abused, that's like not a normal thing. That's not okay. You know, the, the most, you know, the oft repeated sentence of the victim is, well, it's not too bad or some days are better. You know, well, who needs to live like that? We, we have not been called to live like that. And three, help her to make a plan that will guarantee the safety of her children and herself. A lot of times the victim stays in the relationship despite you know, uh, threats to her safety because she wants to maintain her children. Uh, leaving an abusive partner is very difficult for all the reasons mentioned before, especially if it is not carefully planned. So help her make a plan. And four, the best place to, uh, for her to go, actually they say, is not a shelter, but a home. Families, churches, communities need to be involved to break this cycle and help reestablish a safe environment. So we need to understand that being abused by anyone, especially our marriage partner, is against God's law as well as man's law. And I'll talk a little more about this in, uh, a little further in the lesson. So when a woman is in constant danger of being hurt by her husband, she should seek safety for herself and her children. This is her number one priority. And both God and society will back her up on this. There's absolutely nothing wrong with seeking to be safe. All right, so what does the Bible say about this? An additional burden carried by Christian women, remember we said the secret sin, secret because in the church, oh boy, nobody wants to admit that. Marriages ought to be just perfect. Everything is fine and dandy. We're not going to admit that kind of business, right? So an additional burden carried by Christian women who are caught in the domestic violence cycle is what to do concerning their marriage. In the world, if things don't work, especially if the partner is abusive, it's, well, it's not easy, but it's easier to make the decision to just cut them off through divorce and get as far away from them as possible. You know, cut and run. Christian women, however, are faced with a dilemma when an otherwise faithful husband begins to abuse her and or the children. In other words, he's not being unfaithful, but he is being abusive. So she needs to find safety to preserve herself and her children, but she doesn't want to violate her conscience with an improper divorce, even if it frees her from the threat of more violence and abuse. It's kind of a crazy thing. Imagine staying in, a, staying in an abusive relationship in order to do God's will. I mean, just I'm saying it and it sounds ridiculous, you know? And yet, I mean, it's amazing how many women this is their reasoning. I'm staying because it's God's will. No. So it's a very tough decision and problem. And every case, of course, is unique, should be looked at individually, but there are some general principle from the Bible that you know, can give us some help in this. So first, first concept, okay? We deal with concept. It'd be nice you know, if you go through the Bible and say, you know, oh, chapter 29, domestic abuse. Chapter 32, dealing with, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, laziness. Chapter 41, you know, what to do with, it doesn't work like that. You, you have to look at the principles that are taught in the Bible and then use your knowledge and wisdom uh, you know, to apply those principles to your situation. So what are some of the principles? Well, don't be unequally yoked in the first place. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. What does Paul say? Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Paul speaks here of not uniting ourselves with pagans so as not to pollute our worship, believe it or not. A lot of people immediately take this verse and apply it to marriage, but he's not talking about marriage in this particular passage. He's talking about worship. He's talking about religious association. So he says, you know, uh, you, you ought not to yoke yourself with pagans you know, because they're 
uh, religious ideas are contrary to uh, Christian ideas. You, know, you shouldn't be yoked with them. Now, when I carefully examine the marriages where there is abuse, I rarely, if ever, find a situation where a woman married a good and faithful Christian man and then he turned out to be an abuser. It happens, but it's, it, it doesn't happen that often. You usually see the signs long before the marriage. For example, he's not a Christian or he's a marginal Christian or he begins to verbally or emotionally abuse before you marry. And of course, women you know, are thinking, well, that's okay, because I will change him. Yeah, right. The woman herself was not a Christian or she was weak in her faith at the time she got married. Or the couple engaged in sex before marriage, blinding out any chance for an objective evaluation of the other person before marriage. One of the psychological reasons why we should not engage in sex before marriage because um, uh, intimate contact before marriage blurs our vision of the individual, of knowing exactly who they are. Anyways, that's a whole other topic. If someone really loves the Lord, it will be obvious. And if they do so, they'll know how to love you. It's what I said to our own children. Marry someone who loves the Lord, and if they know how to love God, I mean, if they really know how to love God, then they'll know how to love you. When you marry a person who is not a Christian, you marry an unregenerated sinner, and there is no telling what they're going to become without Christ. So that's one principle. Uh, obviously, it's a preventative one. A lot of people, they're already married, so this is too late for them. But for those who are younger and not married, this is a good idea. Number two, loving yourself is the second greatest command. That's the part where we don't understand. You know, in Matthew 22, verses 37, 39, Jesus said, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Okay, that's the first. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. So the greatest command is to love God with all of our being. We understand and practice this command by believing and obeying Jesus Christ. The second great command is to love ourselves, not to love our neighbors. We, we love ourselves first and then we love our neighbors. We're to show love to our neighbors in the way we love ourselves, not vice versa. First, we learn to love ourselves and then we can extend that love to our neighbors. It doesn't work the other way around. Because if you cannot love yourself, right? Well, you can't love your neighbor. You have to be able to love yourself first before you're able to love your neighbor. Okay, so here's the point. One question I haven't dealt with much is why do women in these relationships allow themselves to be battered in the first place? Now you might be wondering, wait a minute, we, we've turned the corner here. One, one minute you're talking about, you know, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, you've got to learn to love yourself, and now we're talking about what, why are women you know, allowing themselves to be battered. The relationship is because they don't know how to love themselves. That's the relationship. And the question is, why do they allow themselves to be battered? Why do they stay in these things? Well, there are several possible answers, doesn't fit all the situations. First of all, they saw this in their own families and they feel comfortable or familiar with this kind of person. Like it's not a big shock to them if their husband pushes them all of a sudden, just psh, because they've seen their dad push their mom around and it's like, oh well, I guess this is normal life. I guess that's what happens in marriage. Because if, if the woman's experience has been watching her father treat her mother with gentleness and love and kindness and, you know, and even when they had disputes or arguments, there was no screaming, there was absolutely no physical you know, interaction. If that's what that woman has seen growing up and then all of a sudden she's married and her husband pushes her against the wall, she's shocked. She's never seen this. What? This is totally out of her you know, realm of experience. But if she's seen this growing up, well, oh, okay, this is kind of, I guess that's what happens in marriage. Another reason, 
Ignorance, and I don't mean stupid, ignorance like not knowledge about these things, or weakness. Some women just don't know any better, or they're too weak emotionally or financially or socially to break out. Remember the thing about batterers that I told you? They're control freaks. They want to control everything and eventually they're controlling this woman so much that they manage to cut off all of her relationships. She can barely talk to her mother on the phone. Friends, forget about friends. So the isolation breeds weakness. She has nobody to talk to. She has nobody to depend on. Another reason, they're addicted to the cycle. Very strange, addicted to the cycle. They like the excitement created by the highs and lows of the cycle. They don't like the, they don't like the violence part, but after the violence, there's all these apologies and I'm sorry and oh, you know, it's because I love you too much. You know, that's why I'm doing this. I'm sorry. You know, and I'll tell you what, we're going to Bahamas next uh, week. We'll just take off and have a vacation and we'll go shopping and let's buy a new car. You know, she likes the highs and lows. You know? She doesn't like that part, but she likes the apology and the honeymoon part and the quiet, we get back to normal part, and she likes that. <clears throat> I don't think the woman could actually write that down, but that's one of the reasons. It's like, well, this is my life, and you know, it's, sometimes it's bad, but sometimes it's really good, so she just stays. And then one uh, most common denominator, however, is that these women don't like themselves very much. Remember I said, love yourself, you know, love others as you love yourself. You know. They don't love themselves very much. Because a woman who really values herself will not allow herself to be slapped, kicked, punched, shoved, abused. She won't allow it. So why? Why this low self-esteem? Oh, a hundred reasons. Perhaps abused as children in some way. Perhaps divorce or problems in parents' marriages for which they take the blame. Mama was unhappy all of her married life and somehow that's my fault. If I was a better child, if I would have been more obedient, if I could have been more helpful, I, I went off to college, I should have stayed, blah, 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 blah. you know, come on, let's go. Hundred reasons. Too much negative feedback or too little approval as children. I mean, they're, they're, like I say, there's a hundred reasons for low self-esteem, but, but women who have you know, very low self-esteem usually find themselves in these type of situations. And abusers, they have this antenna, <laughs> like a divining rod, you know, to find water. They have this antenna, they know, they find these women somehow. Because they'll date a woman who has a very strong sense of self. She's been raised to stand up for herself and you know, and she's been, you know, she's, she, you know her parents did a good job with, with her. She likes herself, she respects herself, she won't let herself get pushed around. And she's dating this guy and all of a sudden he says, ah, you're a B word, you know, something like that. That's the end, <laughs> sorry. You can't talk to me like that. I told you this before, our, our eldest daughter, Julia, used to have the, uh, the list, you know, you know, when she was in the Marine Corps, guys would want to date her, to, why not? Nice blonde, blue-eyed Marine girl, you know? And she'd say to them, well, she said, if you want to go on a date, I'm, I'm game, you know, go to the movies. You know, she said, but I have a, just a, a few little rules. Sure, sure, we're all about rules in the Marines. What are your rules? Well, first of all, we're not going to have sex. <laughs> you can bring me, do whatever you want, but under no circumstances are we going to be intimate in any way before we're married. Number two, uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to ply me with alcohol or drugs. You're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. It's not going to happen. Doesn't matter if we go to a party, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to happen. Number three, you will not lay a hand on me ever because I'm going to call my brother and he's in the Marines too. <laughs> that was her little speech. Now I'm not saying we have to be that drastic, but Julia had a good sense of herself. She would not allow her, herself to be you know, pushed around. Unfortunately, not all women have this, have this type of strength. 
for whatever reasons, these women have esteem problems. And the first step to help them get out of this cycle of violence is to convince them that they are worthy of being loved and cared for properly. It's not a miracle to have a man love you properly. That's not a miracle, that's normal. What you're going through is abnormal. It's not God's will, it's not society's will either. In other words, if they love God and want to obey and please God, one of his commandments is to love yourself. And in practical terms, this means first, you don't have to live this way. You don't have to. Loving yourself means avoiding situations where you can be abused or injured for no reason. The Apostle Paul was ready to die for the gospel if he had no choice. But given the opportunity, he loved himself enough to escape those who wanted to kill him whenever, the Lord, whenever he had a chance. You know, they wanted to kill him in one city and he managed to have himself lowered in a basket you know, over the wall to get, to get out of town in the middle of the night. Number two, you don't deserve this. God is our judge. He's the one that'll you know, do the punishing. The state also has a right to punish criminals. You break the law, the state has the God-given right to you know, try you and put you in jail. But nobody else has this right, including our spouses. Loving ourselves means that we will not allow anyone to abuse us for any reason. Abused women need to know that protecting themselves from harm is part of doing God's will. Because He loves us, then we should love ourselves too. We need to get out of this strange, weird thing that in staying in a relationship where we're being constantly abused or harmed somehow fulfills God's will. <laughs> How we ever get there, I don't know. But that's not Jesus talking to you. That little voice that's saying, oh, you need to stay and take a few more smacks. That's not Jesus talking to you. That's the devil talking to you. Number three, understand that abusive partners are sinners. That's what they are. Ephesians 5, he says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Now the Bible doesn't say it in a negative way, you know, thou shalt not abuse your wife, it doesn't say that. It says it in a positive way. You know, Paul gives the positive command to husbands as to the treatment of their wives. They are to love them as they love their own bodies. Anything you do for yourself, you will do for her. Anything you wouldn't do to yourself, you would not do to her. Your goal is to love her as Christ loved the church. And this includes feeding and protecting and nurturing and yes, even sacrificing your life for her if this is what is required of you. Have you ever thought that every time she has a child, she is risking her life for you? and your marriage? Obviously there's no room for abuse or manipulation or violence or obsessive control. No use for that. That's absolutely, totally unbiblical and unchristian. Peter says that a husband who does not honor, understand, and care for their wives will not be heard by God in prayer. 1 Peter 3.7. So God will judge everyone in the end and husbands who have been guilty of outbursts of anger, violence, abuse, will not inherit the kingdom. You ever think about that? You know, we're always quick to say, you know, when Galatians, where Paul has said, you know, fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, you know, the bad guys, you know, they, they won't go to heaven. And we're thinking, well, yeah, murderers and those people, they, they, they don't deserve to go to heaven. But he goes on, outbursts of anger, abuse, violence, you know, those guys don't go either. 
The bottom line in marriage is peace. People think the bottom line is happiness. I'm not very happy for whatever reason. So therefore my, diver my divorce is you know, legit. But in the Bible, the bottom line is not happiness. <coughs> happiness you know, goes up and down. You know, if you're sick, you know, you're not very happy if you're sick. You know, if, you're, if you're doing good, making a lot of money, you are very happy. You know, happiness is a very subjective thing. So that's why the Bible doesn't say the bottom line is happiness. The bottom line is peace. First Corinthians 7, he says, but to the rest, Paul is talking now about marriage. He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Best case scenario is that two Christians who are virgins get married, they establish a Christian home for life and then they die and they go to heaven. That's the ideal. Wonderful, isn't it? Be nice if we could do that all the time. Some people do it, sure. Be nice if everybody could do it all the time. In the first century church at Corinth, not many could claim this ideal. So Paul gives instructions to guide the various marital combinations. So let's go back over them a little more slowly. In verses 25, 26, 27, 28, uh, he talks to singles. He says, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life and I am trying to spare you. So he's talking about various situations, various marital situations that are taking place in Corinth and he's giving instruction in each case. So here he starts with singles, single people for whatever reason. So he says to singles, it's better to remain that way, but if they marry, they don't sin. So if you're a virgin, when they, when, when they talk about a virgin in the Bible, they're, uh, they're referring to a, a woman who's never been married. The assumption is if she's never been married, she's never had sex. So that's why they, all virgins are un, you know, single people. And then he talks about the ones who are divorced. You're released from a wife, you're released from a husband, either through divorce or being a widowed. Better you stay single, he said to all you people. In those days, there was persecution in the church. Many of them were slaves. And so if you were a slave and you were married and your, your master decided to sell you, he would sell you but keep your wife. You were broke, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a stable situation. So he said, because of this type of societal situation, you're better off just remaining single. But then he says, but if you can't, meaning if you can't restrain yourself, if you have to be married, and there's no, nothing wrong with that. I mean, God designed us to be married. So he says, if you can't stay single, well then if you marry, you haven't sinned. Go ahead and do what you need to do, okay? Then he talks to others, uh, verses 10 and 11. He says, but to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. So now he's talking to Christians who are married. And he says, if they're having problems, they can separate to work things out, but they mustn't divorce. Well, nothing new there. You know, if you're a Christian and you're married, you ought to stay together. Okay, verse eight and nine. And notice I'm taking them out of order here just to kind of make it a little clear. He says, but I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So he's talking to the unmarried. Who are the unmarried? Well, they're not the virgins, right? 
And they're not the married, so who are they? Well, they're the divorced, calls them unmarried. And then he talks to who else? To the unmarried, those are the divorced, to the widows, widows and widowers. All right? So to these people, the widows, widowers, and the divorcees, he says, they're better off remaining unmarried for the same reasons, the trouble in society and all that. But if they can't control themselves, if they can't control their sexual desires, they're better off getting married again than sinning through fornication. Finally, to those married to non-Christians, and for the purpose of this lesson, I include abusive husbands in this category because most times batterers are non-Christians or they are Christians in name only. Okay. Or they are Christians who have fallen away. Paul gives this advice. He says to them, if you can live in peace, do so. Don't leave because you are legitimately married and you're the only chance he has of hearing the gospel. Living in peace in a domestic violence situation means that he's getting the help he needs to get the situation under control so there can be an attempt at peace in the marriage. If there's peace in the marriage, there's a chance for happiness in the marriage. But if there's no peace in the marriage, forget the happiness part, not going to happen. So this can mean that the partner actually abandons the other. But in a domestic violence situation, it could mean that the partner refuses to live in peace and to stay is to continue to live under the threat of violence. So when Paul says, you know, let them go, that passage I read previously, you're not under bondage. He includes the idea of peace here. If they won't stay with you, if they refuse to live with you in peace, you're not under bondage to remain, he says. He says in verse 16, don't be so sure that forcing him to stay, living under siege will force him to be saved. You don't know for sure that you will or not. <laughs> Excuse me. A lot of women think if they just stick it out another year, he'll get better. If I just, you know, like it's up to me. If I stick it out, he'll get better. But He's not doing anything to get better. He's not getting any counseling. He's not trying. You're, you're not openly discussing the thing. You're just staying in the cycle. And usually what the woman is trying to do, she's trying to expand the cycle. That's her strategy. Instead of getting hit twice a year, she's going to try to expand the, the cycle to maybe just getting hit once a year. That's her way of dealing with it. Okay. So Paul is saying that if the unbeliever is willing to live in peace, despite your differences, then you should stay because under the circumstances, you might have a chance to save his soul. On the other hand, if he refuses to live with you because, your faith, uh, because of your faith, excuse me, or refuses to live in peace with you, then you're not bound to him anymore. Let him go, or in the case of domestic violence, save yourself. Because hanging on in this kind of situation will not guarantee the salvation of his soul. You know this, I'll expand the, uh, the cycle. You know, I'll accept to get smacked just once a year instead, and maybe I'll save his soul. And Paul is saying here, yeah, that's not going to happen. If he rejects you or beats you, He's also rejecting and beating the spirit that is within you. There's the sin. There's the terrible sin. The person that you are committed to loving in the name of Christ, who has the spirit in them and who is the weaker vessel, you know, weaker in the sense of physically, the weaker vessel, this person you're beating. This person you are abusing, there's the sin. There's the terrible sin. So Paul is saying, hey, in a case like that, save yourself. Now the big question, of course, is whether Paul is referring to divorce here or not in 1 Corinthians 7. There are a lot of arguments for and against. I believe that he refers to divorce for one reason in particular. Throughout this entire passage, he's been talking about marriage and divorce, when you can and when you can't. In this case, he simply says that you can. In other words, he says, 
you're not bound. Now the confusion has come because he doesn't use the word divorce, but rather the euphemism that means exactly the same thing. Not bound. Well, not bound means not married. It's the same thing. You're bound to someone means you're married to someone. You're not bound to someone. It means you're not married. And I've heard all kinds of contorted arguments to say the opposite of this. I've heard one argument that says, well, he doesn't mean you're not married or you're divorced. He means you're not bound to the responsibilities of the marriage. Like in other words, you don't have to have sex with him. <laughs> really? That's a pretty tortured interpretation. In a passage where Paul is just talking about marriage and divorce, he ends up by saying, you're not bound. Of course, again, every situation is different and we must carefully examine our conscience and God's word before we make any decisions. But with patience and forgiveness and effort and prayer and repentance, some marriages can be saved and they can prosper. That's why the Bible puts peace as the bottom line. If you can have peace in the marriage, you have a chance at happiness. But if there's no peace, you can't have happiness. So with patience and forgiveness, a marriage can be saved and prosper. Paul says that when everything fails, the believer does not have to be bound to one who rejects them by abandoning them, or I would add, by abusing them, which is exactly the same thing, except the punishment and the cruelty is physical as well as emotional. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to peace, not to abandonment, not to abuse, not to terror by our, by our spouse. Anyone who thinks they need to stay with someone who is abusing them because that's what God wants has misread the scriptures terribly. And they're being victimized twice. Once, once by their spouse, and the second time by self-righteous Christians who don't understand what, the, what God's word is actually saying. All right? 